the first thing we need to do is connect to the instrument such that the laser and stuff that we need for aligning the laser on our cantilever will turn on. So we're using the company's proprietary software called Nanoscope. And the first thing we need to do is connect to the instrument and select the mode that we're going to run in. So we're going to run in one of the most common modes, tapping mode. And then we select what group we're in. So we're doing this in air. There are other options such as fluid. And then we're going to do standard tapping mode. So there's a ton of different experiment types that you can do. And we're not going to cover all these. We're going to go over the basic things like tapping mode. And then um, we'll hit load experiment right here. And the first thing it's going to do is connect to the instrument and start booting everything up. So it's going to ask us to initialize the stage. And we're actually going to wait to do that because if we haven't lined up the laser on the cantilever before we initialize the stage, then it's going to give us an error. And so uh, we're going to wait on that part. Now we're going to go over mounting a tip to the tip holder. This is a very delicate process and it can be difficult to get on camera because I have to be so close and not have the camera get in the way. So what I'm going to do is use an old tip that I don't care about because I know it's been spent. Okay, so if I accidentally drop it during this filming, then I won't be upset. Now, a tip costs anywhere from $20 to $40 each. So this whole box has 25 tips in it. So you can imagine that dropping one or two in a short period of time is not very economical. So I recommend all new users to AFM to practice with old tips. And we have a box on hand of old tips specifically for that purpose so that people can get a feel for it. And I recommend being able to mount and unmount a tip three to five times in a row without dropping it before you feel comfortable. There's a couple different ways to mount the tips. Okay, some people, and like I said, I'm using old broken tips. Some people like to have the slide all the way extended and try and push down to lift it up. And they like to try and slot the tip underneath. And that's one option. Okay, so I'm gonna try and get a good image here. You can kind of see the reflection off the tip there. Maybe if I reorient my light a little. There. So you can see that line on the end that points towards the cantilever. And that is actually what we use on these tips to align it. Not every manufacturer puts that line on there. So you have to look at the box and look at the diagrams in the spec sheet and see which end the cantilever's on. Some tips actually have cantilevers on both ends. So you need to really know the anatomy of the tip that you're using. Okay. Um, removing the tip is easy. We'll just slide the clamp out of the way and remove the tip. Now, my personal preference is I grab the tip. Let's move this a little. I grab the tip at around a 45 degree angle because what you might be able to see in the video is that this part is angled up a little bit. I'm not sure what the angle is, but if you grab it at 90 degrees when you go to mount it, you're going to have to tilt your finger, your tweezers way far in the opposite direction. So I personally like to set the tip in the groove and then slide the clamp up over it and let go in one as fluid as you can motion. And then you can see the same tip mounted there. Now mounting and unmounting the tip does not make it go bad as long as you don't drop it. So if you drop the tip, 
it is almost 100% likely that it is ruined because the cantilever and the tip are so small and so fragile that if you've dropped it, it has likely either dulled it or broken it. And you can check this under a microscope, but honestly, it's not worth the extra effort. I would just scrap it. Now, if we can see inside this tip box, you can see that there's a bunch of tips in various locations. So we actually do this on purpose to try and get try and get a good angle here. Try and get an idea of the quality of the tip. So by default, they'll all be pointing towards the top of the box. Sorry. In this direction up. And those are the brand new tips. So 15 through 25 are all brand new tips. And there are empty slots, and those are ones that may have gotten broken or gone bad. And then we have some tips that are pointed sideways, horizontally, and those are tips that are likely still good enough to use, but maybe not in their prime. So the tip may have dulled a little bit. So if you're just trying to do some, some quick imaging on stuff that's not publication worthy, then you could use one of the slightly dull tips. Or if you're doing imaging on really large features on the order of you know tens of microns, then using a large tip isn't gonna affect your resolution much. Okay, and then we save the new tips for the very fine detailed work as well as stuff that we want to go in publications. Okay, and then we have some tips that are down in the corners and those are ones that are usually broken or dull to the point where they're not usable anymore. And so once this whole box is empty, they'll likely all have all end up in the corners and the box can then be disposed of. The base of the box that where the tips are actually sitting is a silicone coating, so it's kind of springy feeling. And uh, the tips stick very well to that coating. And so you can actually even tip the box and it won't. Uh, the tips won't fall and move around. Okay, so I've mounted a tip here. I'm going to remount a new one without the camera in place because like I said, it's kind of difficult for me to get in there. And then we can begin setting up our AFM for imaging. Now that we've connected to the instrument and the lasers on, we can mount the tip holder onto the cradle and align the laser onto the cantilever. So you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit here on the camera focus stuff because I have to use my manual focus camera uh, because as a, a small field of view, so I, we can look at the small things on the camera. So I mentioned in the previous video that this here's the cradle and we mounted the tip just now into the tip holder. So we're gonna slide the tip holder onto the cradle. It just goes into a dovetail joint, as you can see here. Now, one of the things I didn't mention in the tip mounting section is that the way that we're looking at it, the tip is pointing towards us. So when they're stored, the actual tip is pointing up so that it's not touching the bottom of the storage container, which would break it. So when we place it on here, now the tip is facing directly towards us and it's too small to see, so you won't be able to tell. So now let's look at the anatomy of the cradle as we set this down. So change our focus a little bit and You can still see the tip down below. And up here is the mirror. <clears throat> so the laser comes out from this side here. You can't see the laser. It hits the mirror, goes down and hits the cantilever, bounces back and hits the detector here. So our two objectives here are to align the laser onto the cantilever by moving the mirror and then we're going to align the detector so that the laser is centered on the four quadrants. I'm going to 
try to line this up so that you can see the camera. So this camera allows us to see the cantilever up close and we have to use this camera because our system uses an infrared laser diode and most standard AFMs will use like a red laser and you could look at it under the normal sample setup where we'll be doing the scanning later. But this one uses an infrared laser because it's mounted on top of a fluorescence microscope and so you can't have red light, visible light being put into where the fluorescence microscope objective is. So we have to use this camera because it it's, uh, allows us to view infrared light. So we have knobs on top here for moving the detector in the vertical and horizontal direction. And then we have knobs for losing, moving the laser beam, which moves the mirror and not the laser. And so we're gonna use those to move the laser around and adjust the detector. Now I'm going to try and find the laser. Usually the laser is somewhere up on the chip or the substrate. And it's not gonna be visible on the camera. So usually we'll use the for front to back adjustment knob to try and get the laser visible. Sorry, I've moved the whole thing there on accident, just bumped it. And once we adjust this a few turns in each direction, we see the glimpse of the laser, and there it is. So we're going to align the laser on the very end of the cantilever. So we'll go from the left to right and try and center it, and then we'll go off the end and then bring it back just to make sure it's just barely on the end. So we have three parameters that are shown on the screen and we can see those in two places and I'll explain these in a second. So one place is that they're viewed up here. There's vertical, horizontal, and some, and they're also viewed on the computer and so I'll try and do an overlay here. And so we're trying to center the laser on the detector. And the detector is giving us the current position with the vertical and horizontal. And these are represented as a voltage, but it's related to a Cartesian coordinate. And so hopefully I can get this four quadrant detector diagram shown up on the screen. And the vertical is on minus 12.28 right now, which is the maximum, or I guess the minimum in this case. And once we move the detector a little bit, it might not actually move much uh, until we get past the minimum level. And so you can see the numbers start to move and I'm adjusting the knobs, you just can't see it but we're gonna adjust these so that they're both within 0 0.1 of zero. So plus minus 0 0.1 from zero. And so this is gonna give us good sensitivity because we're gonna be very close to the center of the detector. So they're gonna move around a little bit, but as long as it's moving just a very small amount, it's not gonna affect our data. 
The next step will be to mount the sample onto the base plate. Mounting the sample is pretty straightforward. There's a slot that fits a microscope slide and ours happens to be on a microscope slide. So we can put that this standard into the slot and then use our magnetic clamps to hold it in place so that it doesn't move while we're scanning. So before we move the cradle up to the top, there's these peg holes that we're going to set it in. Before we move that, we need to go into the software and initialize the stage so that the, um, the Z position of the cradle is maxed out so that it won't accidentally, we won't accidentally crash the tip into the sample because until you've initialized the stage, you don't know the exact Z position of the tip. So when you initialize it, it brings it up to its maximum position. So now we can move the cradle up since we've initialized the stage. We need to do this very gently because we can move the, knock the laser and the detector out of alignment a little bit, but we can readjust them once the cradle is set in place. So we gently lift it up and line up the three pegs. And as we set it down, we ensure that the tip is not gonna hit anything. And now you can see that our sample is now mounted underneath our tip. So now we're going to move the camera that we use to view the surface and the tip over the top and turn the light source on. And we'll use this to align the tip and our sample together. We have several different adjustment knobs for the camera. So the camera is located here over the sample and it's mounted to this arm that's attached to this very large vertical assembly. And we can use our fine and coarse adjustment knobs for moving the camera in the Z position or focus. And then we have our two micrometer adjustment knobs, which allow us to move the camera in the X and Y direction. So hopefully I can get this diagram working to help explain this, but we move the camera around as much as we want to, but the sample actually moves underneath the whole setup by itself. So this part down here moves independently of the upper assembly. So we can move the sample separately. And once we've lined up the camera with the tip, we won't lose the location of the tip unless we move the camera because the sample will move underneath by itself. So we're going to use these adjustment knobs and we're going to uh, line this up and bring the, the tip down to the surface. So our goal here is to manually bring the tip close to the surface of the sample. The tip by default right now is about three to five millimeters away from the surface of the sample. So that's quite a ways if you're considering the the small scale that we're looking at. So if we're looking at really small features on the order of nanometers, a few millimeters is quite large. And so if we let the computer bring this tip down itself, it's gonna take a really long time. I think it moves around one micron per second. And so it'll take forever for us to approach the surface. So 3000 to 5000 seconds is a very long time and unnecessary. So the first thing I'm going to do is move the sample underneath the tip because currently it's not aligned and I'm going to use the software to do that. And you're not going to be able to see this happen because uh, I can't quite get the, the lineup uh, for the webcam to see, but you can kind of see it happening on the camera a little bit, just kind of shadows and stuff moving around, not super critical that you see this part. We're just using the XY stage of the sample control. So once I think we're over the surface, we're going to start the adjustment process of bringing the tip close to the surface of the sample. 
And so first thing we need to do is first is try and find the tip. So I'm going to use the focal knobs to look around. And I use the light spot visually. I use the light spot to try and center it over the, where the tip is located. And so I think that might be a shadow. So I think I'm going to move around a little more. And uh, see if I can't find this this tip on the on the camera. Oh, I think that's it. There we go. So the bright brightness is up a little too high, so I can just turn it down on the light source control sam uh, control module. And that happens a lot with really reflective samples, just because the light bounces back really well. So now we can line this up over the crosshair. And then I'll know the approximate position of the tip. So now we're going to try and find the surface of the sample just by changing our focus. And if we keep going in the, the negative Z direction. This one's kind of difficult to see. I've imaged this plenty of times because it's a standard. And I can tell you that this is the surface. And it's hard because the features are really small and it's a repetitive grid. So it looks like a weird interference thing or the pixels of the camera or of the computer screen. But this is actually the surface. There's usually not much dust on there, but this little speck actually helps us see the focus on the surface easier. And so our process here is using three different planes in this setup. So we have the surface of the sample. We have the focal plane of the camera. And so right now those two planes are on top of each other. And the third plane is the plane that the tip exists in, which is currently very high above the surface plane. And so what we're gonna do is use the focal plane of the camera to adjust the position of our tip. So we're gonna use the Z motors in the software, and then we're going to use these three planes to make sure that we don't run into the surface. So we're gonna look at the surface, look at the tip, and then we're gonna bring the focus somewhere in between. That's a safe location where I'm not gonna run into the surface. And then we're gonna bring the tip down. So what can happen is if you're not careful, you can actually smash the tip into the surface. There's no protection against that. Not only will this damage our standard, which is quite expensive, but we will definitely break the tip. And I've done this before once or twice, and it's usually just an odd fluke. Uh, one of the times it, I was focusing on the underside of a microscope slide because it's transparent. So I was looking at the wrong plane of the surface and I smashed the tip in. And so now we're bringing the tip down into focus. The sample plane isn't moving. The focal plane isn't moving, but the plane that the tip exists in is moving down, and we're going to bring it to the focal plane of the camera. And since the surface is not in focus, we know that we're not going to run our tip into the surface. And so you can see this kind of double image, one's the shadow, one's the reflection, and now it's into focus. And we don't have to get super precise on this because we're going to do this a couple times. So now the focal plane and the tip plane are together. We're going to move the camera down to the surface. And now you can see the shadow of the tip on the surface reflection. And so that means we're, we're getting close. But now we're going to go back and find the tip. I do this a few times going back and forth just to be confident that I'm putting the camera in the correct position. And so there's the surface. And now we're going somewhere in between and bringing the tip down into focus. And there it's in focus. So now we'll go look at the surface. And this is a really cool technique just because it uses the camera to help us approach the surface. And this is something that a computer would have a hard time doing, but as, as humans, we're, we're well equipped to make these judgments. So now that we've gotten these really close, we don't want the tip to touch the surface. We're going to have the computer do the final approach. And so this is 
definitely close enough because we can see what looks to be the out of focus tip as well as like the shadow on the left. And so this will be the point at which we we can hand it off to the computer. So I like to realign this to where the tip is on the end of this red crosshair so that I am not just wasting camera space uh, so I can see more of my sample surface. So now we know that the tip will approximately touch down where that red crosshair is at the top, and that'll help me if I want to position it over a specific feature or something that I can see on the camera. But this sample happens to be uniform because it's a standard, but on, on regular samples, it's quite handy. So we've approached the surface and we're ready to control this through the software. So we won't use the, the webcam anymore and we'll go look at the software right now and finish getting this scan ready. Well, now we have our sample mounted, our tip mounted, and we have approached the tip to the surface of the sample within a reasonable distance. Next thing to do is to use the software to uh, actually take the scan. So we're using the proprietary company software called Nanoscope. And when we open Nanoscope, you saw that previously where we connect to the instrument and select our, our mode that we're running in. Now, they like to do this top-down, left-to-right approach, which is very handy, usually makes sense, has a nice flow. And if we look on the left side here, we're in the setup pane, which makes sense because we just did all this setup. Uh, we'll go through the panes as we go. But in the setup pane, we're looking at the probe setup section. We set up our probe. We aligned our laser. We centered the probe in our optical view, approached the surface, and moved around as needed. Now at the bottom here, we have our tuning section. So we actually need to tune the cantilever. And so I'm going to open the manual tune window, but we're going to actually use auto-tune. It just helps us see things a little easier. Tuning is uh, where the software is going to determine the optimal parameters for this specific tip. Now we have tips that are optimally 300 kilohertz in their, for their resonant frequency, but realistically, they're somewhere around 300 kilohertz. So we're going to scan a frequency between, I'd say, 200 and 400 kilohertz, and it will likely end up in that range. Um, you can always scan wider ranges if you're not sure. And so the top plot you see here shows the resonant frequency, which we haven't started yet, so you can't see. And the bottom plot shows the phase of applied to measured frequency. And so all we have to do at the bottom here is hit this auto-tune button and the software will take care of the rest. So that peak you see on the top is near the resonant frequency. And so it's just doing some fine adjustments here. And it comes down somewhere near 260 kilohertz, I believe. And so now we can just exit this window and the tuning is done. It's a very simple process. It takes only a few seconds and uh, it is required to be able to use tapping mode. So now we finished our auto tune. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is make sure you don't adjust the laser after you've auto tuned it. And if you do, then you re auto tune it. Um, the next pane here is the navigate pane, which I personally find kind of useless because it's the same as the setup pane just without all the text. So you can do everything in the setup pane and just kind of be done in one go. Um, the next pane after that is the check parameters pane. The check parameters pane is really useful because you get to check your scan parameters before you actually start the scan. And so, um, sorry, I moved this out of the way a bit so that we can hopefully see it while we engage the scan. But um, there's a bunch of different scan parameters that you can alter. The main one you want to alter before you actually scan is the scan size. Okay, the scan size being the actual size of the window of the image that you're going to acquire. So uh, it defaults to 500 nanometers, which is really small. And knowing the features here, I'm gonna the the features are uh, 10 micron pitch. I'm going to make this quite a bit larger. 
Uh, a handy thing is that when you're in nanometers in the software, you can type in in the thousands and it'll switch to mic uh, microns. And then once you're in microns, you can type in any number and it'll stay in that unit. The next option is aspect ratio, which is by default one. So this is the ratio of the length to the width of your uh, image. So one is going to give you a square that is 25 by 25 microns. Uh, if you want to save time and do smaller scans or smaller aspect ratios, you could change that. Sorry, they would be larger aspect ratios. Then we have our X and Y offsets, which are which move the tip around and take images from different areas. So you have around a plus minus 50 micron ability in the X and Y direction. Uh, but this is different than the motors that we actually use to move the sample. So th those in the setup and navigate pane, we move the sample underneath the tip. And with these, we actually move the tip itself using the piezoelectrics. Um, and then after that, we have our scan angle and scan rate and samples per line. So the scan angle uh, tells us, or by default, it's going to scan left to right as seen on the camera. So that's zero degrees. You can change the scan angle. Uh, there's a multitude of reasons you might do this. One of them being if there's a large feature uh, and you want to scan a certain direction so that you get better, uh, better image quality on the on the face of it or something, if it's slanted. We use this in uh, doing thickness measurements where we we score a line in a film or something. Um, the scan rate, we do need to change. One hertz scan rate is really fast at like 50 microns, but it's kind of slow if you're looking at like a one micron image. So that's just kind of subjective. And then samples per line. Um, so that's the actual pixel resolution of your image. So the tip is tapping hundreds of thousands of times a second, but we're not acquiring all that data. We're just going to acquire as many samples as we sit here. So if it's 256 samples per line and we have a square image with the aspect ratio of one, then we're going to get a 256 by 256 pixel image. Um, and that changes uh, automatically the software controls that stuff when you change the aspect ratio. The feedback parameters down here are the things that we might alter if we need to get the image to look a little better, but we'll do that on the fly. And So the integral and proportional gain we typically leave at these values uh, unless we have some real problems with our image. The amplitude set point is the value of the cantilever oscillation amplitude that the feedback loop maintains. So this is what the Z moves the Z position up and down. And the drive amplitude is the force of the applied, the tip application. So that's how hard we're tapping. So now we're gonna move on to the uh, engage section, which is actually not its own window, but it, it starts the engage uh, process where the tip is going to approach the surface and it's actually going to open the scan window automatically when we press engage. So this is going to cause the tip to start slowly moving down. So it'll move the motor down one micron and then it'll extend the Z piezo down to try and see if it can sense the surface with the tip. And then it'll keep repeating that until the tip can sense the surface, which would be with amplitude dampening. So we're going to watch the tip approach over here on the camera. So this is the same camera that we use to align the tip or uh, approach the surface, I mean. And uh, you can actually see the shadow getting closer and closer and it'll eventually be in the same plane and measuring the or start the scan automatically. And we'll talk about the scan window in a second. And you'll be able to, maybe in the video, I can't remember if it records this audio, you'll be able to hear the beep that the system plays when it approach, when it finally touches down. And so if you look at the camera right now, you can see that the uh, sample is actually moving under the tip and the tip isn't moving itself. So there's a lot of information on the screen right now. So I want to pause the scan so we can talk about it. Uh, but first, I'm going to try and clean up the scan a little bit. 
So usually when the tip touch is down, we need to bump up the drive amplitude because it wants to, the software wants to touch it down softly so that it isn't going to damage the sample. And then you can decide how much you want to uh, increase the force that it's tapping the surface with. So we have four channels showing on the screen, um, only three of them being populated, and we can have up to eight. And each of these channels has different information in them. So the top left channel is showing height information, and the top right one is showing the amplitude error, so that's the error in the applied amplitude. And then the bottom left one is showing the phase image. Now we don't usually use the second and third ones as publication, but the uh, you can use it um, you use the height one, but you can use those to make sure that your image looks good. So underneath each image, we have these red and blue lines. So one is the trace and one is the retrace. And we're actually plotting the trace in the actual, in the image. The trace and retrace are the scan from each line. So it scans each line twice, left to right, and then right to left. And so this is the Z profile. So this is basically a cross-sectional view of that line scan. And I think this will make a lot more sense once we actually once we get to some features. Because right now I think we touch down on the flat silicon surface and not on uh, anywhere where there are pits. So hopefully it'll make more more sense once we see that. And so with these other image types, um, like I said, we're not going to use them but you need to look at them and make sure that they at least correspond pretty well with your height image because this is gonna indicate whether you're seeing artifacts or real data or um, who knows, maybe it's just background noise, but uh, you need to at least pay attention to them a little bit. Uh, the phase image is actually uh, really useful sometimes for telling the difference between uh, materials that have multiple components into them because the phase is dependent on the uh, modulus of the material so it will if the materials has sections with different moduli that they will uh, show up differently on the scan so this has to do with the uh, the elastic or viscous or viscoelastic nature of the sample which will affect how the uh, the force of the applied amplitude versus the measured amplitude will give you difference in phases between those materials. So I'm going to restart the scan here and uh, I'm hoping that we'll see one of the pits on the standard surface over here and you'll be able to see the difference in the um, in the trace and retrace scans because right now our, our height scale is only uh, 30 nanometers ish which isn't very much. Um, so there we actually start to see some of the pits and our Z scale is off. So that is the uh, coloring that's applied to the image to give us our topography. Uh, and the, you can tell it's off because the um, trace and retrace can't fit on the screen. So we can auto scale it and I can pause this scan here so we can talk about it a bit. So if we look at the trace and retrace, now you can see the pits and so this kind of makes more sense that we're seeing a cross section of the image and we need to monitor the trace and retrace because uh, they should ideally be identical right because you're scanning the same exact spot and so if you look at the pits here we can see that when we uh, go off the surface and down into the pit um, Hey, it actually looks like it's about 180 nanometers deep looking at the Z. So it goes from about plus 80 to minus 100. But uh, sorry, that was a side tangent. But as we go down into the pit, we might be scanning a little fast because it um, overshoots and the blue line goes past the red line. And the same happens when we come back the other way and the red line overshoots the blue line. So that probably means we're scanning a little too quickly because uh, the tip doesn't have time to uh, set down. So the feedback loop doesn't have time to execute before it shoots off the edge and kind of uh, doesn't, doesn't meet this sidewall here. So this is something that we could, should be able to easily fix uh, by slowing down the scan. And hopefully that is the case because um, otherwise we might have some issues with our amplitude set point or our 
our um, gain settings. But uh, I'm pretty confident that changing the scan rate is going to help this out a lot. And we can hopefully get these walls to the side walls to clean up a lot. So I'll restart the scan here. And I'm going to drop the scan rate to about half a hertz. And so we'll see in a second after it refreshes. And it looks like our, our lines almost line up now, the, the trace and retrace, which is what we're hoping for. So there's a little blip on the screen where we adjusted the scan rate, and that's totally fine. That's just from the, the change in speed. Um, and we're not going to actually save this part of the image, so the images aren't saving automatically as we're scanning, so we actually have to save them. So um, if we have any blips or glitches that are caused by us adjusting settings, it's not a big deal. So it looks like we're only going to get a few different pits to show up on the screen with a couple on the edge, like partial ones. So I'm going to up this to 50 microns, and hopefully we can get maybe a 4x4 four four grid or something like that uh, to show up. And so it's going to take a second for it to stabilize, and it, it hit another plateau. And so we're going to change the file name up in the top right. And you need to use something characteristic of your sample, since this is just for uh, uh, testing purposes, just to show you guys. We're going to do uh, call it test on the standard. And I'm going to put 50 UM for 50 microns. And it's nice to know the size of your image without having to open it. And I'm going to enter that. And then I'm going to, um, I have to change the capture location. So this is where the data is going to get saved. So I'm just going to save it in our general AMSEC directory. No problem. And I'm going to hit capture. So we have different things for capture. So right now it says capture next. So this is our status. And then when it turns around, it's going to say capture on. And it wants you to not change any settings during a frame, so a single scan. And if you do, it's going to switch back to capture next because it wants to capture the next frame. So when it says capture on, you don't want to change any settings. And then it'll say capture done when it's finished and capture off when nothing's happening and no captures have been completed. So we're going to do a time lapse here and finish this capture. It looks like it has around eight minutes left and uh, we can get this going. Um, if you do change a setting, you can hit the frame up and frame down buttons, which will just send the scan to the top or bottom of the frame. And then you don't have to just wait for it to make it all the way back by itself. Um, so again, don't change any settings unless the image needs cleaned up. So obviously you want to do it if that's the case. So it looks like the image is almost done. Um, and it also looks like we could have gotten a five by five grid of, of pits, but uh, if I would have offset it a bit. So there's offset and zoom options underneath the image. So the zoom one will change the overall size of the image. So if you hit zoom, you'll get a box and you can zoom in on a specific area and it'll use the offset xy offsets if you hit offset you get this tiny crosshair that's almost impossible to see and wherever you put that crosshair is the new center of the image so by executing that it'll use the x and y offset to move the center of the image um, once the image is done the capture has finished and it just turns around and keeps scanning so you don't necessarily want to keep doing that forever because you're going to uh, dull your tip. So any scan time is going to dull your tip. So after our image is captured, we're kind of done with this, right? Unless we wanted to scan more areas. And we're going to skip the ramp section of our, our left side panel because it's kind of just an advanced thing that's very specific use case. And uh, we don't really need it for most things. So. We're going to hit the withdraw button, which will pull the tip off the surface just a little bit, and it's going to stop our scan. And it's not going to pull it off far enough to, 
to worry about running into the sample if we wanted to move around and scan a different area of the sample. And then um, I'm going to pull the tip up and change the sample to the uh, silver sample. And uh, I'm going to time lapse through that because it's the same exact process that we went over in depth, but uh, we'll just skip through it pretty quickly so you don't have to watch the same thing again. So I'm going to hit withdraw here and you're going to see the tip pull up off the surface on the camera. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. And then we can go back to the setup window and uh, manually move the tip further away so that when we switch samples, we don't risk running the tip into the new sample. So we have re, uh, put our new sample on. We're going to check the parameters real quick. We uh, you know, checked the alignment of the laser. We uh, auto-tuned it. And we approached the surface very close, as you can see in the camera. And looking at the camera, you see that the, the morphology of the surface is a lot different than, or the topography, than the previous sample. And that's because this was a silver suspension, you know, however these were synthesized, nanoparticles, rods, whatever they are, we have to actually scan to see. Um, they were just drop cast onto this. So it definitely looks a bit different. And so um, we'll re-engage at a 50 micron scan and you can see the tip approaching the surface. We always want to engage at a larger scan size just to make sure that we're not missing anything. And we can always zoom in if we need and look at things, but we can't see stuff that we're not actually scanning. And again, we're probably gonna bump up the drive amplitude right after it touches down because it usually touches down a little soft. And then unfortunately, we're just gonna have to wait a bit and see what the scan yields, if anything. So only only waiting to see what the scan shows you. Uh, will you know if you need to zoom in or look around or what the shape or size of anything is? So it starts off looking not very good. And something looks a little funky, like it looks, there's a shadow on the video. So it looks like it's not, you know, even on the surface, but that could again, just be a shadow. So we'll bump up that amplitude and see if anything shows up on the screen. So there's a little bit of fuzz, as you can see on the trace and retrace. Not sure what that is. We'll just scan a little further and, and see what things look like. It looks like the image is cleared up a bit. And so you can start to see maybe some features. Again, we just need to wait for the scan to, to keep going. Um, I'm going to bump up the amplitude a little more like it just did there, just because I think that uh, we need a little more force because we're scanning on a glass slide with some what are supposed to be metal particles. So this might help it out a little. And it looks like we're running into something fairly large here, a uh, few hundred or more nanometers tall, maybe four or 500. We can't really see because it's clipping off the Z scale there. So auto scaling this again might help us a bit so kind of interesting to look at right now is that there is a this kind of rectangular structure i don't know rom rhomboidal rhombus structure underneath that peak that we saw so there's the whitish area and then there's this like rectangular thing around it. Um, and so that's probably our particulate. And if you look down on the phase image, you can see this structure much more uh, defined against uh, the substrate because the phase is based on the um, modulus of the material. So it's going to change differently between or showed much more drastic between the background and the sample. And this is nice to compare to the height image just to see, you know, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? So we think that that whole rectangular thing is actually the silver and we can see it with the one directly next to it also. And so 
we'll let it scan a little more. We want to see if there's anything else that we uh, want to look at in this region, or maybe we want to zoom in on some of these things and look closer. So I'm going to give it a new file name, and we'll just um, we'll capture this once once we think the image has cleaned up enough. So it's a little bit of a waste of time for us to um, let the scan keep going as is. So it's going to turn around at the top of this frame and it's going to scan back over the stuff that we've already looked at. So we can use this frame up button at the top and it's going to send the scan to the bottom of the frame where it's going to begin scanning down there. And then we'll be able to see the half of the image that we haven't scanned yet. And uh, this will save us plenty of time because it's quite a slow scan and uh, I'm even going to speed this up a little just because we've already seen the other half we're just hoping to see that this half is fairly similar to the rest of it uh, I won't speed it up too much it seemed to be a bit fast unnecessarily fast and so we just want to see if there's particulate stuff to look at on this lower half of the image. And then if we think that the whole image is going to be a good uh, representation of the sample, then we could capture it then. So I'm running into some large things. So I think uh, I'll slow it back down. It's a little too uh, too large. It, it might it might stress the tip too much and the cantilever. Um, and I think I'm going to drop the amplitude set point because we're still getting a bit of this background fuzz. Uh, that's probably noise, probably from our uh, feedback loop not having adequate time or the the our amplitude set points too large for the feedback loop to to be able to resolve the tiny little features and so a, a few more adjustments here so this is in stark contrast to the standard we just imaged which was pretty easy as it should be so there's a lot of stuff and texture on this sample that's going to change change things quite a bit so it looks like the image is really good i think we should capture it so I'm going to hit capture and we'll do another time lapse while this thing captures for I think it's another eight or nine minutes total. So the image just finished capturing, and uh, that's kind of it, unless we wanted to zoom in on anything or move to a different spot to see if everything's the same. There's lots of reasons to keep scanning, and uh, I likely would if this was a research sample of my own. But uh, as this was just an example, I think we did pretty well. So we'll withdraw this and then uh, shut the instrument down, which is 
pretty simple. It's, you know, pull the tip way back from the surface and kind of undo everything we did. So move the cradle, uh, take the tip holder off, take the tip off and put it back in our box if we think it's still good and uh, shut down power. And so uh, one quick way of of pulling the, uh, the tip all the way away from the surface is just to initialize the stage because it's going to max out the Z position. And then we don't have to go click and hold the Z thing. Um, but I think we'll just, uh, we'll probably be able to post this, these two sample data sets if anyone wants to use it. So thanks for watching.